Hi, welcome to the week four of the accounting uh, course. My name's Nigel. I'm presenting the accounting course this week. Um, uh, I'm just going to quickly share my screen. So, um, last week we covered errors. Um, errors are the bane of accountancy. So we dealt very briefly with uh, what errors are and what their impact is. Um, we talked about a couple of the most basic uh, accounting controls to pick up errors. We also talked about a few other controls about how you prevent errors in the first place. So it was a bit of an introduction, but it was quite useful. So if you haven't already seen that, it's definitely worth going back and having a look. But this week, we're going to be covering double entry bookkeeping and accounting. Um, uh, this is a um, technique that really has been around for three, 400 years. And I'd say every accounting system in the world is based on double entry. So I thought it'd be quite useful to understand, to ch chat about what it is and, and to see it in practice. Um, and then double entry feeds through to something called a trial balance, which again is a really basic component of all accounting systems. Uh, and then we're gonna talk about journals, which are methods of moving figures from one account to another. And we'll talk in particular about debits and credits because some people love them, some hate them. And hopefully by the end of this session, it will feel very simple to you and you'll feel very comfortable with them all. So we're going to start with, um, uh, just gonna get the sp spreadsheet uh, up. Okay. So, um, assuming you can see the spreadsheet, um, this week is going to be almost entirely a practical session because a lot of the things we're talking about are much easier to understand if you see them in practice. So, what we see at the uh, what we see here is a list of various balances um, of this entity as at the first of February 19, uh, 2021. Uh, I don't know if you remember when we very first started talking about accounting, we said there were two types of transactions. One was movement during a period, and the other is balances at a particular point in time. So in this particular example, we've simply got a, an entity which has got a bank current account of £1,000, and uh, it's got share capital of £1,000, and I'll explain what the pluses and minuses are in just a minute. But the idea of double entry is that for every single transaction you carry out in your accounts, and I mean literally every single transaction, there's always two sides to the entry. One is what you have taken the money from, and the other side is what you've done with that money. So the idea of double entry accounting is to account for both sides of any transaction. So for example, we've got a thousand pounds in the current account. What happens if in transaction one, what happens if we move, transfer 800 pounds from the current account to the deposit account? So the double entry says that we're going to move stuff, move money from the current account. That's the one side of the entry to the deposit account, that's the other side of the entry. And the way we record this in accounting terms is we reduce the current account by showing minus 800 pounds, because that, that re is, reduces the, the, the bank balance. And we that money goes is paid into the bank deposit account. So we increase, we put a plus 800 pounds to, to increase the amount. And if you look at the balance, at the end of the period after this one transaction, what this uh, document shows is it starts off with the balances at the beginning. It adds or subtracts each of the transactions to get a balance at the end of the period. So at the end of the first transaction, we started off with nothing in the deposit account, but we had a thousand pounds in the current account. And through this double entry, we've moved money from the current to the deposit account moved it from the current account to the deposit account. And the balances, as you would expect, show that the current account has reduced from a thousand pounds to 200 
and the deposit account has increased from nothing to 800 pounds. Now, just for anybody who's interested, uh, just the mechanics of this spreadsheet, if you look at the bank balances and look at the formula, the formula simply adds everything all the way along here. So that's what these formulae do. And I want to draw attention to something. There's another formula we've done, which is we've added everything in this column here. So if you look at this number here, it shows it's the sum of everything from C9 to C16. And this formula says, add it all up. And the sum of these entries has gone to zero. So sorry for stating the obvious, but this is a really important part of double entry bookkeeping, which is that by definition, if you add everything, all the pluses and all the minuses, they must come to zero. So I don't know if you remember, we talked when we were talking about spreadsheet errors about setting up a checksum. The whole of this, um, this line at the bottom actually is a checksum because if the numbers ever don't equal zero, then there's an error in your double entry bookkeeping in your journal. So all of these transactions we're going to be talking about now, these illustrations are very simple and it's almost impossible to see how you could have errors. But take it from me that when you start getting more complicated uh, journals, it actually becomes quite easy to make errors. So whenever you're doing any journals, it's really important to check that the total of the journals equals zero. If it doesn't, you've got an error in your double entry and you, your accounts cannot be correct if you've got an error in your double entry. So transaction one was really very simple. Uh, we transferred 800 pounds from the current account to the deposit account. The second transaction, and we're using an example of a bike maintenance company. This was the one we talked about last week. Um, and in this company, they buy um, uh, various tools in order to be able to maneuver and to, to repair the bikes. Um, and this company during this month has bought spanners, which are tools for 150 pounds. So what's the transaction, the, the double entry for these transactions? The first thing to note is that when you buy, uh, buy goods, you pay money out, you reduce your bank balance. So we're going to reduce the bank balance by 150 pounds. And if you look, the bank balance was at 200 pounds, has now gone down to 150 pounds. And I just want to draw attention, the checksum figure, the total of this, all of the entries for the transactions does not equal zero. And of course, that's because we haven't entered the other side of the double entry um, uh, books. And so the question is, what is the other side of it? And the answer, of course, is that we're buying tools and tools are assets that we're going to keep use time and time again. So I've created a line for tools and I'm going to put the plus 150 pounds. I bought some tools. I've decreased my bank current account and I've increased the amount of tools I've got. So again, if we look at the balance sheet at the end of the period, we've now got tools of 150 pounds. The bank deposit account is still 800. The bank current account is reduced to 50 pounds. Our profits and our share capital hasn't changed. So our bank balance sheet still balances and happily our double entry um, satisfied the checksum, it's correct. The third transaction here is that we are um, going to service a bike. So by servicing it, what I mean is someone comes into the shop, brings a bike, we're going to use our tools to do the servicing, and we're going to charge them 250 pounds. So in this particular service, all we had to do was to loosen a few screws, tighten a few other bits, everything else was in great working order. We didn't use any materials in doing the servicing because it was so easy to do. And what we did is we received 250 pounds and that represented sales. So how do we record this? This time in our bank current account for transaction three, we've received 250 pounds, so plus 250. And because we've got double entry bookkeeping, and I say this intentionally, and we'll explain a bit later with debits and credits why this is the case. 
we show a minus figure of profits. Now on the face of it, minus is a bad thing. Something strange is going on because our profits are actually plus, not minus. How could it be that we're showing a minus 250 pounds? Okay, I'm gonna leave that question hanging and we'll talk about that a bit later. But for the time being, if I had put plus 250 pounds in my profits, my double entry wouldn't have worked. So I'll come back and explain this another time. Uh, the tip I would give you is that if you ever got any assets in the um, assets or liabilities in your double entry bookkeeping, always start with them because it then becomes much easier to know what you ought to be doing with the capital and reserves, which is the other side of what you do with the assets or liabilities. So the next thing we do is pay rent. And that reduces our bank balance by £175. And that goes against our profits. So if you can now see our profits, which were £250, have gone down to £75. And our bank balance has similarly been reduced by 175. There's quite a number of transactions, but our bank balance at the end of the period is 175 pounds. And the final thing we're going to do is to get a bank loan. Now, the reason we're going to get a bank loan is because although we're not recording it just now, we're going to go and buy a whole load of other tools and we need money to be able to do so. And in order to do that, I want money in my current account so I can buy stuff. So. I'm going to create a liability to the bank of 200 pounds. So I'm going to show that as a minus 2000 pounds. And again, I'm going to state a liability is the opposite of an asset. And if an asset is plus, a liability has to be minus. So I've created a loan of minus 2000 pounds and a bank account of plus 2000 pounds. The total of all the transactions goes back to zero. Very happy with all of that. And at the end of the period, I've got tools of 150 pounds, bank deposit of 800 pounds, current account of just over 2000 pounds, which is lovely because I can go and do all sorts of stuff with that money, which I need to do. I owe the bank 2000 pounds. At some stage, I'm gonna to have to repay them. But for the time being, this is what I need to finance my business. And against that, I've got minus 75 pounds of profits which for a strange set of reasons, the minus of profits in a balance sheet means you've, got, you've, you've made profits as opposed to losses. And we've got share capital of a thousand pounds and happily my balance sheet goes back to zero. So my double entry is all correct. So this was an illustration of what double entry is all about. That for every movement in any asset, you record that one side of the entry and wherever that asset goes to, you make that in the other side. So that's the double, double entry. And I'm now going to repeat that process. I just want to make it a bit more familiar, a bit, bit more comfortable using the analyzed cash book that we were, we've dealt with in the previous months. Just a couple of points to highlight. We've got an audit trail here. The reference is the audit trail back to some original documentation. So if I needed to see what overseas travel is, I can easily find the document. This is my audit trail, the reference. And with a mortgage re repayment, that 225 pounds was partly interest and partly a bank repayment. I've got a document to show how I arrived at those two figures. That's my audit trail, so that I can go back and check if I wanted to at a later date, whether it was correct or not. Just repeating what we've discussed in the past. Again, the entry, the bank entries we've then analyzed. And one thing that's interesting here is although we didn't describe it as this, the cash book itself is a form of double entry bookkeeping. And the reason for that is the column that shows your pluses and minuses in the bank statement are the one side of the double entry and your analysis is the other. So if I had bought some tool, if this is said tools instead of administrative expenses, this would be the tools I bought. But as it happens, this all represents profit and loss account items. So if you can see we've sold to overseas travel 1,121 pounds, that was the plus. The double entry is minus 1121, or our total sales for the month were 2,441 pounds. 
So I'm now going to, I want to record this in my, uh, in a summary of what my assets and liabilities are at the end of the period. And I'm going to call this something called, a, call this a trial balance. So we've actually already looked at a trial balance. Uh, what I showed you was a slightly simple illustration to show double entry, but the trial balance lists all your assets and liabilities, all your profit and loss accounts, all your capital, and it shows the balance at the start of the period, all the movements during the period to get your balances at the end of the period. So because we've already um, seen how the anal analyzed cash book works, I'm now going to record these figures in the uh, trial balance. So I'm going to record the sales movements come straight from this figure here. The materials figure comes straight from this figure here. The admin expenses come straight from my analyzed cash book here. The interest comes straight from my cash book here. And my bank repayment loan comes from the analyzed cash book here. And look something interesting. The minus a thousand pounds that we owned is the bank loan has been correctly analyzed because we've repaid it. There's been plus 500 pounds. My loans come down to 950 pounds. But look, I haven't yet done my double entry because my the, the, the check sum, the, the total of the journal is incorrect, is not tally. And that's because I haven't yet recorded the bank entry, the bank total, the other side of the double entry, which is this figure here. So let me record that now. And the sum, the figures now add up correctly. And if there were no other changes in the accounts, this is what my balances are at the end of the period. And we'll see the bank balance of 933 pounds tallies with my 933 pounds in the cash book. So that's good news. And what this uh, trial balance shows is simply a representation of the totals of the figures that we used beforehand, but in a way where I can get more sophisticated because not only have I created a profit and loss account? If you remember beforehand, we transferred these figures straight to our profit and loss account. But I'm now also showing movements in my balance sheet in other assets. So in this case, the bank loan changed. So I got a movement in the bank account. Something happened in here. The other side was the bank loan. And for the month, I've got various sales, materials, admin expenses, and interest. So if I add all these together, there's an interesting um, feature of spreadsheet that if you add the figures together, um, some spreadsheets actually show you the totals. And in this case, we've made a profit of 312 pounds. It's just a quick shortcut way. If I did a different presentation, that's what that, how that would appear. But, I, but the balances now appear in addition to the profits, I'm now also showing the movements in the balances at the beginning of the period. So this is a trial balance and uh, it's one of the most useful tools and most important tools. And the reason I've shown it this way is that when we come to do computerized accounting, this is all done automatically for you. But what I want you to always remember when you're doing computerized accounting is that this is what you're doing. And the reason I want you to, to understand this is it's so much easier to understand movements in uh, uh, computerized accounts if you understand the basis of what you're trying to achieve. And the basis of what you're trying to achieve is taking balances at the beginning of a period, recording movements in the cash book, and coming up with balances at the end of the period. And because of double entry bookkeeping, because every transaction has got an equal and opposite transaction, that's the double entry bookkeeping, the figures must always equal zero. There's lots of other different ways of expressing that. Uh, but this is an extremely valuable way of understanding accounting. And that's the end of our um, introduction to, um, uh, to the spreadsheet, to the um, trial balance. So let's just quickly go back to our presentation to see where we're at. Okay, so we've just dealt with the double entry. We've dealt with trial balance. The next thing we're going to talk about is journals. So let me switch back to the spreadsheet and I'll explain what journals are all about. Okay, so far so good. This was all relatively simple, but what happens if these numbers 
are wrong. There were additional changes that we hadn't recorded that we now need to record. So without seeing what they would look like, it's actually difficult to imagine. But let me give you a couple of journals and I'll show you how we record those in the trial balance. So um, I've created a couple of journals. And the first journal is that we had bought some tools quite a long time ago. One of the tools we bought was some chains, or I, I will actually say that's stock rather than tool, but we'll talk about the distinction between stock and tools a bit later on. Um, but we bought some bike chains, and during this particular service, we actually had to put a new chain on. So even though we didn't pay for it during the period, in order to get our sales, we had to pay a hundred pounds. We had to use up a hundred pounds of our stock or tools in order to get the sales. So whereas our sales were 2,400 pounds and we didn't buy materials in the month because we already had it in stock, we actually used up a hundred pounds of stock. So the first transaction is how do we reflect that in the accounts? And the uh, simplified way of showing it is that we reduced the tools or stock by a hundred pounds and we spent money on materials of a hundred pounds. So I'm now going to reflect these in the trial balance. So in the trial balance, I'm going to bring that, for, that uh, um, uh, entry in the journal for the tools um, into my trial balance. And again, because I've only recorded one of the two sides of the transactions, you'll see that the sum, the, the total figure is incorrect. And I now need to add that to my materials, which is the other side of this journal. So the totals come back to zero. And this mechanism by which I've transferred some money that were in tools into my materials to reduce my profits, the mechanism in accounting terms is called a journal. And you'll notice up here, I've got a reference to which the journal is. This is part of the audit trail. I don't need to put it in audit trail. I'm just highlighting that that's what this is so that I can understand why this entry is what it is. Go back to the journal itself. And in the journal, I've got a reference number. And this reference takes me back to an individual transaction, which would explain why I did what I did. And in this particular case, it might be someone who did the work, said I took a chain for hundred pounds, please allocate that um, against the profits for the month. So it might be a chit and you might write the reference number and file that chit somewhere. And that's your audit trail back to understand why it is that you did this individual transaction. The second tr journal uh, transaction for the month is that our bank started getting very antsy with us. They said, we have to repay back money to them, but we didn't have enough money in the bank for everything else we needed to pay back the bank loan. So the business owner said, okay, I'm gonna pay money back into the business for you. And this, this, this business transaction shows that the bank loan, remember the bank loan normally is negative, we owe money to the bank, is gonna be paid off. So that becomes a positive figure. And instead we owe money to the owner. That's what this transaction says. So let's show this in the trial balance in journal two. In this case, the bank loan is paid off. So we've reduced our loan by 500 pounds. But the reason we've done that, the double entry, is that we instead we owe money to the owner. And we're now recording this. We've recorded both sides of the entry. So the total becomes zero. And our balances, which automatically add every, all of the, the total of the balances brought forward, plus all the movements in the month, automatically accommodate this. And we've now got these balances at the end of the month. We now have a different profit figure. I don't know if you remember the figure was 300 and something pounds. Because we've reduced the profits by 100 pounds, it's come down to 200 pounds. Our bank loan has reduced, which is lovely, but instead we owe more money to our business owner, the business capital. Um, we owe 1600 pounds. Again, our total of all of our assets down to zero. And our journal is the mechanism by which we put these transactions through. So the total of everything you do in a trial balance is you start off with assets at the beginning of a period. In this case, we're, we're accounting for a single month worth of transactions. We record everything at the beginning of February. Our movements in the month are the cash book plus the two journals. And our balance at the end of the period 
is uh, the, the addition of all of these figures. And what this format does for you is to allow you to create an audit trail of all of the, of the, the movement, the, the, how you've arrived at the uh, balances at the end of the period, how you can trace back to the accounts, the balances at the beginning of the period, plus the movements during the period, going back to the audit trails, back to the individual documents if you want to do so. And that's what a trial balance does. And um, next week we'll show how easily this trial balance then gets transferred to the formal statement of profit and loss accounts and balance sheet. And we've now created another tool in our armory of creating accounts, which is the uh, double entry bookkeeping, our trial balance and journals, uh, and how we get from our journals to the balances. And there's only one other thing I want to talk to you about uh, in this session here, and that's something called debits and credits. And this is simply a language that accountants use. And if we're doing bookkeeping, we need to understand that language, which is slightly more sophisticated than simply saying plus or minus. But debits and credits don't do anything other than talk about plus and minus. And I'm now going to go back to the cash book. This is the cash book that we've recorded. And beforehand, we've talked about pluses and minuses. Uh, we simply showed uh, the plus, and we started off with the balance. Um, when we started off with our analyzed cash book, we started off with the balance at the beginning of the period, simply showed the pluses and minuses to get the balance at the end of the period. In accounting language, we show it slightly differently. We have a column all to itself for balance. So we can say for each transaction, what the running balance is at the end of each transaction. And rather than show a plus or a minus, we show something called a debit or a credit. Now, I'm afraid this is entirely arbitrary, so I can only tell you that this is what we do. I can't give you any rhyme or reason. Unfortunately, you have to remember it, but I have a little bit of a tip as to how you remember it. But the pluses are debits and the minuses are credits. So commit that to memory. I'm gonna give you one little bit of a tip of how you remember that what debits and credits are and how you remember which is the pluses and which is the minuses. So the only tip I can give you to remember, help you remember the debits, is that most people know if they have a debtor, it's money owed to them. So a debtor is the, what we call the, uh, somebody who has money, which is in debit, it's a debtor. So a debtor is a plus because somebody owes us money. That's the only way I can recommend you remember it. And all other, you can remember all other assets and liabilities by reference to a debtor. So if a debtor is plus, then if you reduce a debtor because they've paid you, the money goes into a bank, your bank balance increases, your bank balance must be in debit. If it increases, you debit it, you increase it, you debit it to increase it, and you credit it to reduce it. So with the debtor, they owe us 100 pounds. During the period they pay us 100 pounds, the double entry for this is, we reduce the debtor, which is originally a debit, so the journal must be we credit it, and we increase the bank balance, so we must debit the bank balance. That's the one tip I can give you. The other tip, and this is absolutely pathetic, but I think you'll find it useful, is does a debit go on the left or the right? And it's really difficult to remember. So the only tip I can give you is that there's an R in credit, which helps you remember that credits go on the right. I'm sorry it's pathetic, but it is arbitrary. The whole of bookkeeping is based around these debits and credits. No one ever gave a reason as to why they chose which one they did. It is just the way it is. And I hate to say it, but you just have to know it. But I'm gonna whiz through a couple of examples of accounting journals using the debits and credits. I'll try and use that logic as to how we remember which is which. So if you remember our analyzed cash book, we had various movements in the month. 
I want to see, if I want to create this as a journal, what does the journal look like? And the answer is, and just if you'll take from me, these figures all come straight from the analyzed cash book that we just showed. We increased our bank balance by 262 pounds. So just to confirm it, we started off with 670 pounds. We increased the bank balance. The bank balance is the same as a debtor. It's an asset, it's a good thing. It's a positive thing for the business. So our asset, we increased our bank balance by 262 pounds is a debit. And it goes on the left because the credit is the one that has, with the R in the credit, is the one that goes on the right. So it simply goes in the left side. Our sales are the opposite of what happened to the bank. Sales money went into the bank. So the other side of the entry must be a credit. Our materials must be a debit. Similar things with admin expenses, interest and loan, because this is the other side of what happened to our bank balance. With material materials, we bought materials and the, we reduced our bank balance. So we had to credit the bank balance. So our materials must be debited. And you'll look to see that the total of all the debits equals the total of all the credits. I've got my check sum because I'm an accountant and do my safety stuff and I always check my check sum. So I'm happy I've got the double entry bookkeeping, but note how I think as pathetic it is that the way I had to do it was I had to start off with something that I could work out for myself and everything else fled fed from that. So in this case, my bank balance increased. I know with my debtor is a bank, uh, my debtor is an asset, my bank account is an asset. So if my debtor is a debit, an increase in the bank account means it's a debit and everything else flows from, flows from there. Similarly with the bike chain, I started off with stock, which is an asset or tools. I reduced the tools. So I reduced my assets. It's the opposite of a debit, which is a credit. It goes on the right because there's an R in credit. And my materials must go the other side because I always get nervous when I'm doing a profit and loss account as to whether I put pluses or minuses or debits or credits. We'll talk about that in another session. Um, it is the other side from the tools. So my materials, uh, my, my journal uh, tallies, check sum of zero. Remember, I've got my audit trail reference back to an original document if I need it. I've got the date of the journal. And I'm now going to put this all into this accounting trial balance. And this is now the simple trial balance, exactly the same figures written how an accountant would do so. So the opening balances, if you remember in our simple trial balance, we just had the pluses and minuses. In a formal trial balance, we have debits and credits. Debits are assets, credits are everything else. So I've listed my opening balances. You can look at this after the uh, session because this spreadsheet will be available to you on the website. So you can look at this in much more detail to try and work out in your head what's going on. I put through my journals using debits and credits. So my accounting journal of the cash book had debit, to the, uh, debit of the bank balance, so there's a debit here, and all the rest of the debits and credits as instructed by the journal. Similarly, journal one has got various debits and credits. And if it's a credit, credit, I've got my instructions to where to put it. Did the same thing with the other journal of my debits and credits. And the closing balances are simply this addition of all the pluses and minuses in uh, uh, referred to as debits or credits. So you can see I've done my checksum because you start getting very complicated with this and you can very easily make errors with the pluses and the minuses. Um, personally, I find this so difficult to understand, even though this is the formal trial balance, I always use this whenever I'm doing my own accounting if I'm doing a manual set of accounts and I don't use computerized accounting. So even though this is the correct way of doing it, and if you get a sniffy accountant coming and saying, oh, you're not doing this properly, this is what I do whenever I'm doing my accounts if I don't use computerized accounting. And I'm just gonna spend two minutes talking about a very strange perspective, a very strange thing about debits and credits, which always gets people. So I'm just gonna illustrate it quickly. And that's when they first get their head around debits and credits. And then they, then they look at a bank statement and they see everything is exactly the opposite of what I just told you. 
So a plus money in a bank statement where you've had money coming in is actually a credit on the bank statement, even though I've told you it's an asset and should be a debit. How could that be? Does that mean everything I've just told you is wrong? And I'm now going to show you why both are correct. And the answer is, you need to look at the statement from the bank's perspective and from our perspective. So when we started our bank uh, at the beginning of the month, in this particular case, we had a thousand pounds in the bank, and that's because we made profits of a thousand pounds the month before. So I've got retained profits of a thousand pounds, assets and liabilities are nothing. The bank's figures show huge amounts of assets and huge amounts of liabilities. It's got 1,501 pounds as its assets. Look, it's got a liability of us of a thousand pounds. What's going on? Well, this is what's going on. We have put money into the bank. We've tra physically transferred money, our sales into the bank. We've paid it into the bank. So we've increased our bank balance and the bank increased their bank balance by a thousand pounds because we paid our money into it. But they owe us the thousand pounds. If we ever say to a bank, I want some cash, a cash of a thousand pounds, they have to pay it to us. But I'm going to show you the journal during the month of what happened in our, in, during the month. During the month, we got paid 120 pounds because we sold some, some, a service to somebody. They serviced us, we paid the money into the bank, we debited the bank, credited the sales. What happened in the bank's records? The bank's records, they, their bank balance went up by 120 pounds because we banked the check, but they owe that money to us. So if we go into them, we now at the end of the month have 1,120 pounds. If we say to the bank, right, give us some cash, 1,120 pounds, they can't say no. They have to pay it to us because they owe that money to us. So in our books, this 1,120 pounds is an asset, it's a plus, because if we ever wanted the money in cash, we simply go to the bank and tell them to do so. Or if we want to use that money to pay off a creditor or to buy stuff, we could, we've got it to do so. In the bank's books, they owe us the money. So showing what that looks like on the statements of the, of the respective cash books, in our cash book, when we deposited these monies, we debit them because in our books, that's an asset. But when we pay the money into a bank, that money, the bank owes money to us. So it's a debit to us and a credit in the bank's books. So when a bank sends you a bank statement, they're not showing you our books, they're showing you their books. And that's why when you look at a bank statement, really confusingly, the debits and credits are exactly the opposite way of what happens in our back book, in our own books. And that's a source of such huge confusion, because if you look at the bank, say, oh, we've deposited money, it's a credit. That means I must credit in, in our accounts. You're actually going to go wrong. Well, welcome back. Happily, you're not going to go wrong because you've now seen how easy it is to, to sort this out. Um, but what we talked about today was uh, what double entry bookkeeping is, what a trial balance is, and how we use double entry bookkeeping to create a trial balance, how we use journals to reconfigure figures, uh, either by accounting for movement through a cash book or accounting for other changes that happen in the accounts because we need to correct things, adjust things. And at the end of it, we get a closing trial balance, which will be the form, which will form the whole of our accounting. We'll talk about that in future months. And then we talked about the very inelegant accounting language of debits and credits. And we had this very simple rule of thumb, which if you just commit that to memory, that can last you from the very, very, very simplest accounts to the most complicated accounts you can ever imagine. That very simple tool of debits and credits, I think will serve you well. So thank you for joining this uh, week four session. Uh, there are exercises available if you want to uh, practice what we just talked about.
the spreadsheet that we um, showed is available on the website as well. Uh, that's the sunshine.courses um, accounting uh, page where you can download them and look at them and play with them. Uh, and hopefully you'll, uh, uh, everything will make sense with you and look forward to seeing you uh, next week. Thank you very much for joining us. Bye.